Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Al Pacino, Colin Powell, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Chaz Palminteri, Carl Reiner, Regis Philbin, Arlene Weiss, and a nun, a cop, and graffiti artist Tats Crow, and more. All just kids from the Bronx. Another one of the kids from the Bronx, Arlene Alda, has put together 65 vivid oral histories into one vibrant portrait of that borough from the early 20th century to today. The book, Just Kids from the Bronx, telling it the way it was. Arlene is an award-winning photographer and author of 18 other books, including children's books that my grandchildren yes. have read. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Hunter College, received a Fulbright scholarship, and then became a professional clarinetist playing in the Houston Symphony. She is married to actor Alan Alda. Welcome, Arlene. Uh, thank you, Doug. Really I am so to excited you. about this, particularly after our telephone conversation. Okay, be talk, before we talk about the Bronx, talk about rum cake. Okay, rum cake. That rum cake was the focus of my having met my husband. Ah, this okay, is this. No, okay. Go ahead. So we're at a dinner party and uh, maybe 10 or 12 people around a table, small kitchen, New York, Upper West Side. The hostess is in the kitchen, old refrigerator, 1950s, rum cake cooling on the top of the refrigerator. <laughs> Okay, she made it. Okay. Homemade. During the course of the evening, this rum cake worked its way from the middle of the top of the refrigerator to the edge and then splat on the floor. Alan and I, in the dining room, were the only two people who went to the kitchen with our spoons and ate that rum cake <sighs> off the floor. That's Love it. How oh, we, man. <laughs> no. I mean, how do you beat that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, cement your friendship. Okay, over. talk to me about the, the next couple of hours. I mean, okay. I can't, I, okay. I, I so want we, to hear more about so this. So now, now, by the way, that was the first official kind of uh, social meeting that we had. We had met once before, but it was like, hello, goodbye, and you know, that was a whole other thing. But, but okay, so now, then after that dinner, our hostess, who was a musician, had invited everyone to the city center. We went to the city center. She was playing in the pit orchestra. Okay, we finished that. Now we're going home. Alan, who is a very dear person, if you haven't already gathered that, was living in Manhattan at the time. I was in the Bronx. No Manhattan boys ever took girls home to the Bronx. He did. But we walked, this is April 10th, 1956, I guess, and we walked through the park from the west side to go to the east side. That night, there it had snowed, believe it or not, April 10th. Okay, it had snowed, we were walking, we were talking, we were happy to, to change information. We both had been to Europe. As we're walking and talking, we're paying no attention to where we are. Going through Central Park, the only way you go through Central Park straight away is through a, a car transverse. Right. But we were on the pads, so we walked and we walked and we walked. An hour later, we're back on the west side. We never got I've through the this, park. Right. You you kind of walk in circles. So okay, you fell so, in love on this walk? Okay, it was, no, We but we were flirting. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, flirting is good. Go ahead. Go from flirt. What happened? No, don't go into all the detail, but go into a little bit okay. more. You know, so uh, th the best thing was that I, for the first time, I was able to enjoy the company of someone who was in a field different than what I was interested in. Ah. The Fulbright really opened up my eyes to the world. Now, what did you, you get know, a Fulbright for? It, it was in music. Okay. But I went to Germany and during that year traveled a lot. 
and the traveling, suddenly all the history I had kind of heard about, read about in books was real. Geography, real. Languages, real. Everything that was from a textbook became, it was like vivid color. It was, it was all real. That was like a revelation to this young, young person who I was. Alan had been that same year, had been abroad for his junior year at Fordham University. My alma mater as right. well. Right. So, and during that year, he also traveled. So that was the point at which we really could communicate. You know, oh, did you see, did you go to Notre Dame? Did you see, uh, you know, did you uh, go walk in the streets of, of Paris? And what about Italy and what, you know? So those things were what we were excited and talking okay, about. Okay, now that, that, that's a perfect segue into, uh, you meet people like Jonas Salk, who you had never met before, <laughs> and there's this, instant camaraderie yes. there's this familiarity and you see it almost over and over again in these vignettes that you've really artfully put together if i may it's just it's affectionate but it's clear-eyed and it's and each of the stories really builds chronologically and you've got you this kaleidoscope becomes a narrative so i compliment you Thank so you. so you've you he's a, a Bronx guy. He's in Fordham. Did he grow up in the Bronx? Okay, Alan did not grow up in the Bronx. He Is he grew a New up, York City person? Okay, he was born in New York City into a uh, a traveling vaudeville family. That's you know, right. Basically. His father was an actor. His father right. was an actor. Right. So he, he spent many years, early years, on the road, basically. And okay. Then, and then ended up in California uh, when he was seven or so, and then came back to New York as a teenager when his father was in Guys and Dolls. Right. So basically he was, you know, for the first 14 years or so, he was... He, he was, was a foreigner. He was a foreigner, oh, okay. of course. So then he comes and he gets yeah. civilized by, by coming to Fordham, <laughs> like, the, like the rest of us. Okay, a question that I often ask friends as well as people who have written, but they, and written about the Bronx, can you really go home again? You've got these these very famous people and, and not so famous people. And the thing that strikes you is they've got roots, they've got core, they've got they've got something. And what is it? And and can you go home again? It's very interesting. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that touched me very deeply is that all the people in the book knew where they came from. That to me is the most critical thing about about growing up and and flowering. You know, not everyone loved the Bronx, the, where they grew up. Not everyone want a lot of the people that certainly in my generation wanted to move out of the Bronx sure. because you know you're in the shadow of Manhattan, where every action is. You know, the Bronx uh, is. A, uh, a group of, I think, 64 neighborhoods, and many of them are very tranquil and suburban. And it's that, it's both wonderful as a place to be nurtured, and also it can be stifling, if you will, you know. Sure. When you, when you want, when you're a teenager and, and beyond, when you want to make your way in the larger world. Yep. Yeah. And then one of the talking about folks who didn't necessarily have a great experience in the Bronx was Neil deGrasse Tyson, who talks about the the discrimination that he felt and 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 what was visited upon him and his desire to escape. Okay. Actually, Neil, I uh, it, it, Go ahead. it's it's complicated because you know as an African American. You know, he felt and he feels, rightfully so, the world defines him from the outside. And Good. he defines himself, of course, as we all do, from the inside. So that that's a jarring uh, uh, view of who he is. Here's a kid at age 12 who's oh, probably a genius, you know, and he got his family 
understands that this boy loves uh, astronomy. Uh -huh. And they buy him a telescope, and he's up on the roof of his building, and he's looking through the telescope, and as Neil describes it, so what are the chances of anyone in all the buildings in Riverdale looking across to his roof and seeing a kid with the telescope? Well, the chances are very low. However, that night that he was out there with what might have been a bazooka, you know. Right. In the, on the roof. <laughs> on the roof. A black kid. Yeah. On top of it. Right. So the a neighbor calls the police. And he also has a cord snaked down to, uh -oh. a, you know, to his friend's apartment. So the police come and they see this little kid, you know, this kid on the roof with the telescope. So, of course, he disarms them completely by showing them the craters of the moon through his telescope. And that's and the first time they saw it. Yeah, yeah. So, Fabulous. you know, okay, so that was one little incident. But the other one, you know, was very interesting. He got a, a, a watch that was, uh, you know, he's full of uh, all kinds of dials and gizmos and whatever, and he led for time everything, you know, through the telescope. And so the watch's second hand the sweet pan fell off. You know, it's inside the house. It's happened, it's happened to all of us. So he brings this expensive watch to a jeweler <gasps> on, the, wow. on the main street in, I guess it's Riverdale, where he lived, which is, by the way, the upscale part Excuse of the me, Bronx. Excuse me, it's the suburb. I mean, it's not even part of the Bronx. <laughs> Too upscale no. for me. It Don't, is the Bronx. Okay. Uh, it ahead. is the Bronx. Uh. Anyway, so he brings it in. The jeweler looks at it. He looks at the kid. And he says, I, I can't fix this. And, it, and Neil says, well, why? He says, because the jeweler says, because it's stolen. Now, Neil, in his supreme innocence, says it's stolen stolen? I mean, he had, I mean, it was his present from his family. And he realized that the, the jeweler made an assumption mm -hmm. based on the, the kids, the color of that kid's skin, that, uh, that this was a stolen watch. So he took it back, went to another jeweler. Same story. So he went home, he took it apart, and he fixed it himself, so he made lemonade out of lemons. But but that whole thing of being defined, you know, by the color of your skin or by the way you talk or whatever, uh, that theme uh, came up uh, in with within those interviews, mm -hmm. uh, and I found it very interesting. But Neil, I don't, I didn't get the feeling that he was anxious to get out of the Bronx as much as he no, had... No, the psychic const and social constraints that people were putting them under. It's teachers, yeah. in fact. Yeah. Let's, let, let's talk about teachers. Well, I mean, there was certain, there's so much here that we could do this for, you know, we could do this for days. You have to come to my house. We'll have, we'll have <laughs> coffee and we'll really talk about this. One is the role of teachers. I've got any number of post-its that these uh, vignettes point to teachers yeah. over and over and yeah. over again yeah. as the, def in a sense, the defining influences on their lives. Yeah. And, and that's why Neil's was a little bit different in terms of attitude. But talk about, you know, teachers. And then another, let me just run through this. You talked about it just a moment ago, the role of a dream, even the dream of escape. And then there's luck. So many, so much of this is. I mean, you and the you and the rum cake. It's just dumb luck. How I met my wife was dumb luck. Carl Reiner, very you know, a young kid in school. He has this little boy, this little innocent kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Okay, teacher, uh, Christmas time. Who can entertain? Carl says, I can entertain. You know, one kid could tap dance. What could Carl do? He could stand on one leg and wrap the other leg around his neck. Right. I mean, right. <laughs> what, what a talent. Right. Okay, and, he, and because of that, the teacher took him around to other classes. Hey, this was a great 
great experience, okay. Then uh, in another, another grade, okay, he's, he's in a play and his, his, uh, his mother is there and the principal says to the mother, that boy, he's the best one. And it was Carl, and Carl's comment was, sure, I was the best one. I was the loudest one. Right. Okay, okay. So then he gets into high school, and is, he's, he loves music, and he loves acting, and, and, the t and uh, he, he's in the chorus. Everyone has to take music. Mm -hmm. And uh, his friend, the teacher asks, who can sing, you know, whatever, and call. He doesn't volunteer himself. His friend volunteers him. Okay, so he's it calls, sings the teacher to uh, Mr. Raskin says, "Okay, you're in. In what? I'm, you know, you're you're in the chorus. Sings in the chorus. Teacher realizes, hey, this kid has a nice voice, so he pairs him up with a soprano, mm. uh, who whose name is Ruth, and they're doing a, an aria from from some opera, and it it's something like." The English version is, I am a duck. Okay, so he's in this aria, and, and they go to this big deal concert at a different high school, Julia Richmond High School, and they travel from the Bronx in there, and he's there, and the rehearsals went beautifully, and, and uh, the soprano was singing, Carl is right behind her, he comes on stage, and something overtakes him, he can't help himself singing, I am a duck, and he starts waddling like a duck. Starts waddling like a duck, the, the whole audience is laughing. The more they laugh, the more he does it. Of course. Okay, so his, his career was like set, set right then and there. He, he had the audience, he, he loved it, they loved it. And that's just one illustration of the impact that you, you document of teachers. Let's talk about you writing the book because you remember all, you must have had a blast doing this. Yeah, it was great. I'm, can you imagine meeting and talking with 64 terrific people who are your fellow, you know, fellow whatever you call it, compatriots. Right, from, compatriots, come on. From, now, but, uh, talk to, how did you start this? Yeah. And talk about sort of how you put it together. Yeah. Um, I, I, it started uh, it, in, a, in a kind of a serendipitous way. I went back to the building I grew up in with a newfound friend who also grew up in that building, someone I didn't know and someone who, who, who whose uh, presence in the building I did not know when I was growing so up. So you met this and person was, and then went back. Yeah, and that was the CEO of J. Crew, and his name is Mickey Drexler. So Mickey and I went back to the building we both grew up in, and we were comparing notes. Uh, and during that little visit, I was very struck with not only how important those, those beginnings were, but how little I knew about so many mm. people who grew up in the Bronx, who uh, had achieved a measure of success. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to find out more about where they grew up and what their experiences were as children, what their insights may be even now looking back. So that started uh, my interviewing process. I still didn't know if there was a, a book there. So who did you start with? Uh, Regis Philbin lives uh, oh God. in a building. Work with, yeah. with Regis at yeah. WABC. Yeah. So it's, it's, he's he's the way he is. He's he's fantastic, you know. So Regis was, you know, so so happy to be interviewed. And I had heard him. I had heard him tell a story about his uh, childhood fascination with Bing Crosby. And I was curious if he could get into that a little bit more. And he does, <laughs> at length. I mean, it's sort of crazy, but I mean, he thought he was Bing Crosby. Right. And disappointed I mean, that he wasn't. Right. And it went on through, you know, through elementary school, high school, through college, and his, his uh, 
parents come to his college graduation and here's their golden boy and what does he want to be? He was he he was at Notre Dame University. Right. And he's he uh, he still wants to be Bing Crosby, you know. So uh, he gets into the he goes he enlists in the Navy. He said, "I'll tell you what I'm going to be after after the Navy." Anyway, his, that whole dream led him to uh, really to the entertainment field. And that's I mean that meant that that goes to the one of the points that I made earlier. It it's the dream. It's not only yeah. it's the roots, and it's also the dream. Al Pacino. Yeah. You interview Al Pacino. Had yeah. you ever met him before? We had met uh, Al Pacino. Uh, uh, actually, met him a number of times. He's really a you know the most lovely man. And but the circumstances under which we had met in the past were more formal. Sure. Yeah. And so for, to dig into his his past was really interesting for me because I really didn't know much about his background. And basically, he's a child of a divorced household. Wow, a lot of a lot of them were broken homes, alcoholic parents. Yeah. I mean, the fact that they did what they did, some of them are fairly remarkable. And then, then there's other other families who, like uh, Colin Powell's, who's you know, you know it was totally totally uh, tight, yeah. extended nuclear. Go ahead, right, I'm sorry. But no, but with with Pacino, he had the the stability of. A grandmother, a grandfather, and a mother who really cared about this little boy, but he was he was poor. <laughs> but early on, talk about teachers. Early on, yep. a teacher recognized that this kid had talent. You know, he would be the kid who read read Bible verses in the assembly. Hey, come you on. Know. You know, also as a young boy, his mother took him to the movies all the time, you know. So he'd, he'd go to the movies, come home, and at, you know, four years old, be acting out the scenes for his grandfather. Uh, okay, was, let's, let, let's talk about the neighborhood. Let's talk about movies. I mean, when, when I grew up, when you grew up, you, you went on Saturday and you saw two double features. You saw shorts, cartoons, and newsreels. And did you have matrons, women with oh, flashlights? Oh, with a flashlight. Oh, oh that man. matron was like from Buchenwald. That, yes. Yeah. They, my wife describes them as Nazis. I mean, and <laughs> yeah. they were. I think they were all dry. They imported them from, <laughs> from Europe. I, I, so They're definitely not from the neighborhood. No, they were definitely not from the neighborhood. So, yeah, and, and sort of taking a trip through the book, I mean, you've got the movie theaters. You've got the Grand Concourse. My favorite is, and I remember it because I, I dated women when I was at Fordham who used to go there, Lomans, oh, which yes, no longer Lomans. exists. Yeah. I mean, Lomans is mentioned a couple of times in here. I yeah. mean, the, there are real iconic places. Now, Lomans doesn't exist anymore, does it? Well, I, uh, I haven't been to a Lomans in a long time, so I know the Lomans in Manhattan doesn't exist. Yeah. So I'm I hope assuming- the one... In- I'm assuming the one in the Bronx, but Suzanne Braun Levine, you know, talks. Right. She, she has a hysterical reaction to uh, to being in the communal changing room at Lomans, you know, where she saw these bodies of women that, you know, she had never seen right. before. It was like a ghastly experience. Oh, nice, a ghastly experience. <laughs> well, I guess it was ghastly for, you know, a 19-year-old guy to wait for his girlfriend to come out of from that. But it was a, it was, it was a and mecca. An iconic. And oh, then yeah. you had, I yeah. mean, later on, Alexander's, the yeah. Grand Concourse. Talk about the Concourse, because the Concourse, as my aunts and uncles remember it, was... was the place with the Art Deco buildings. Yeah. When I went to school in the 60s, it was deteriorated, but it's coming back. Talk yeah. about the Bronx, the Bronx now and the Bronx then. Yeah. What, I mean, what are the continuities? What are the differences? Yeah. Well, when I knew the Grand, what I knew of the Grand Concourse was limited. As as we all know, the neighborhood was your place. It was your country. It was like you needed a passport to go to. No, you're right to no go kidding. to Alexander. Right. Yeah. But early on, we knew how to take the buses. You know, cross town. And, and so, well, we did the subways too. Yeah. 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 And the subways. And we walked. Know. Yeah. I mean, excuse me. We've walked all over the place. I mean, yeah. I live yeah. in the suburb. People don't walk. They don't have legs. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm so ready. anyway, Grand Concourse. I, I could give you two things about the Grand Concourse that I that I knew as a kid. Alexander's department store. 
Okay, shop, that was yeah. yeah. Everyone used to shop in Alexander's, yeah. and you got good bargains Oof. there. You know, and that was very the D train we used to take that from. <laughs> so ahead. I took two buses to get there. Wow! And also the uh, the Parrot Lowe's Paradise Theater. That oh, was man, you know, yeah. an amazing movie yep, theater yep, yep, yep. that had statues and it was and it was a palace. Spot, yeah, and these movie theaters were made as palaces. I forget how many people you know it could uh, uh, seat, but they, they, it was <sighs> amazing. I remember and the thousands. Ceil- yeah, the ceiling was was full of stars that <laughs> that sparkled. And I mean, it was I know. an amazing I know. place. Good and place to all- take a date. So I hear. Oh, nice! <laughs> In the balcony, so yes, I thank hear. You. <laughs> but uh, you, oddly enough, that was also rented out for graduations from high school. Our high school graduation, Evander Charles High School, took place at the Lowe's, what we call the Lowe's, but now I know it's the Lowe's. It was Paradise. Lowe's. Yeah. I mean, what's wrong with these people pronouncing it correctly? <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> the Paradise Theater. You know, huge place. But by the way, the high schools in in my day were huge. I you told know, my first job was at James Monroe High School in the Bronx. It was it was a city. Yeah, yeah. You're talking of uh, several thousand kids. Yeah, uh, five thousand. We 5, had five thousand. Yeah, kids. absolutely. Yeah. Where did you go to school? Evander Oh, you were on the yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, the, the half hour is so up already. Well, so, go ahead, talk. So you know, concourse. Now I've been there only a few times recently. What I love about it is it f- has the same feeling. It's bustling. There are people shopping and there are people doing and family. You know, it had the same feel. I was very exhilarated, you know, and I have this crazy thing in the back of my head. Could I ever move back to the Bronx if I had to? And, you know, damn it, I could. Oh, yes. yes. I could. Excellent. I mean, that in my fantasy, it's like, okay, I'll fix up an, a little apartment and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll paint it my, you know, am I going to do it? No. But, but you've done my, it in my, your head. And not only that, I, I think those crazy fantasies are because I feel very comfortable there. When I walk in my old neighborhood, which I've done many a time, I feel like I belong there. I, you know, it's so you like can, I own the place. Okay. So you can go home again? In that respect, yes. Okay. I don't know. In reality, whether I could because I'm spoiled, I don't know. But in terms of my spirit and the way I feel, sure. My thanks to Arlene Alder for a book, Just Kids from the Bronx. If you want to know about early pot growers, booze distributors, pornographic picture drawers, <laughs> and happy families and otherwise, your polio epidemics, Fordham University, the Bronx Zoo, the Botanical Gardens, the Third Avenue L, Lomans, all of it, all of it and more is in Just Kids from the Bronx. Join us next week when we ex- continue to explore the Bronx with Bronx site Phil Koltoff, author of The Block, here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.